Mary Frances, thank you very much for joining me today for this uh, quick Q&A. How are you doing? Very well, and thank you for the kind invitation to participate in this uh, conversation. It's my pleasure, obviously. Um, so Mary Frances, as Director of Insurance Regulation and Policy um, in the Regulatory Affairs Department at the IIF, um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, some of the rumours that uh, spun out from the pandemic with regards to regulatory acceleration in the financial services sector. Um, what's the situation within insurance in particular? Well, Lily, let me start with the broader financial services sector, and then uh, I will talk about insurance. And broadly speaking, uh, the pandemic really did not give rise to a spate of new regulations in the financial services sector. The Financial Stability Board found that the international standards that were put in place in the wake of the 2007-2008 financial crisis provided sufficient flexibility to support an effective policy and regulatory response in 2019 and 2020. And similarly, the IAIS has found that despite uh, quite a bit of market volatility in 2020, the global insurance sector remained financially and operationally resilient, aided by existing supervisory measures and by monetary and fiscal support measures, of course, by some, uh, some governments. Uh, according to Vicky Saporta, who, um, is the IAIS Executive Committee Chair, the adoption in 2019, at the end of 2019, of the holistic framework for the assessment and mitigation of systemic risk in the insurance sector really allowed the IAIS to quickly assess the impact of the pandemic on the global insurance sector and to support global dialogue on supervisory responses. And as I mentioned, they found that the existing framework uh, was, was sufficient. Of course, supervisors did heighten their oversight of insurers. You have to expect that. Uh, they wanted to confirm that insurers were able to weather the pandemic and continue to provide key products and services to their customers. And insurers did continue to provide those products and services. And they really demonstrated strong resiliency during the crisis. Now, that's not to say that there weren't some, uh, some pain points during the process. There were some disputes over coverage, particularly business interruption cover. And that highlighted the need for both for greater clarity in contract terms and conditions, and uh, also highlighted that some policyholders may hold high, uh, rather unrealistic expectations about the uh, extent of their cover and perhaps hadn't paid sufficient attention to, uh, to some of the terms and conditions in their contracts. So I think work was done on both sides to address, uh, to address some of those uh, concerns. And supervisors also during the pandemic focused on some heightened risks uh, that became evident during the pandemic. And the one I would point out in particular is cyber risk. Because as we saw during the pandemic, there was a substantial uptick in cyber attacks and particularly ransomware attacks. And those attacks uh, affect insurers in two ways, both as targets of attacks and also uh, as providers of cover for those services. They, they saw a heightened uh, a claims experience from the ransomware attacks that were also affecting other sectors, particularly healthcare schools. And so a related challenge for insurers was just the rapid digitalization of the industry as the conduct of business, the conduct of work uh, moved increasingly online. And we saw that, you know, it, it's great that we have digital technology like we're using today, uh, provides very significant benefits, but there are some operational challenges and risks that um, need to be addressed. And one of those particularly, and this is uh, reflected in a lot of the work that the IIF is doing around operational resilience, relates to vendor and supply chain management. It's very important in the, uh, in the digital economy. And so insurers and other financial institutions as well need to consider the implications and what we, uh, the experiences that we had in the pandemic for their operational ris uh, risk management and their vendor management. 
especially when a limited number of suppliers of, um, for, for example, cloud services providers uh, can give rise to concentration risk and can create a potential single point of failure. So that, that's what I would highlight from the, uh, from the supervisory side. How did, uh, how did the insurance rea uh, uh, sector react um, to, to the ransomware attacks and the, all the cyber risks? So uh, where, where should this go in the future? Well, I think that cyber risk and uh, operational resilience are going to stay front and center for, for quite some time uh, because uh, these, uh, these concerns were really pronounced because you had these cyber incidents occurring at the same time that you had a lot of uncertainty in the market. You had uncertainty about the health situation. You had uncertainty about the, uh, the state of the markets, about financial uncertainty. Uh, so I think that um, they really, these cyber events really became front and center. Um, and the other thing I would say about cyber events is that they can really uh, reveal or exploit both firm level vulnerabilities such as control weaknesses or poor cyber defenses. And they can also reveal or exploit system level vulnerabilities such as concentration risk that I just uh, mentioned before. And uh, when these events escalate to an incident that causes loss or otherwise harms firms in the financial services sector and harms their ability to deliver products and services to customers, uh, you start to um, have concerns about uh, financial stability implications. So I, I think these are these are very very important um, risks that need to be managed, monitored, and managed uh, going going forward. And in terms of the response by the insurance sector, uh, I would say that response is evolving. Uh, insurers are expanding and refining their operational risk management frameworks to reflect this increasing and ever more sophisticated cyber threat landscape. And there's growing understanding, and I think this is critical, that this is not just an IT issue. It's an issue for the organization as a whole, from the board of directors to the employees across the organization. And it also reflects that in many cases, there's a need for greater training and awareness by employees, because a lot of cyber events are precipitated by employees who are not well versed in cybersecurity common mistakes can give cyber criminals a path into systems and networks. And so I'd say the insurance sector response is evolving. The official sector response is also evolving. And the official sector from the Financial Stability Board to the IAIS is assessing the risks and challenges of the rapid growth in financial technical innovation. And at the IIF, we've emphasize the need for more public and private sector collaboration, along with, very importantly, law enforcement. And better information flows between the public and private sectors could help to communicate changes in the threat landscape or the emergence of new actors, new cyber criminals. And better information flows can also help companies with their awareness and their training on cyber risk so that they can develop stronger lines of defense and reduce those common human errors that can give cyber criminals ac access to systems and networks. And information flows would be facilitated by greater alignment of cyber incident reporting protocols. This is something that the IIF has been uh, talking about for some time and recently published a paper on. Um, greater alignment in uh, the protocols for reporting, when reporting is required, to whom, if, within what period of time. And moreover, greater clarity from the official sector, including law enforcement, on how those reports are used and by whom they could be accessed would motivate greater levels of, of reporting. Another thing I wanted to um, to mention is the consumer protection issues that are uh, 
uh, part of financial technical in innovation. The insurance industry, as well as the broader financial services industry, has a very good track record in protecting and securing customer data. However, with the growth of machine learning and artificial intelligence tools, and with new affiliations with non-financial tech firms, there's a need to redouble efforts to ensure that customer data is protected and that technical partners who are not part of financial services of the financial services industry and are not subject to the same regulatory and supervisory scrutiny as financial services firms, they, they need to adhere to the same high standards that the uh, insurance and financial services sector uh, adhere to. And I would just mention that um, the IIF has, has been working in, in the area of um, technical innovation, financial innovation for quite a few years now. And we developed a data ethics charter that articulates principles for the ethical handling of customer data. And that charter and those principles are designed to be dynamic and adaptable, reflecting that we are in a changing environment. And the principles address responsible data management, data control, algorithmic decision making systems, partnerships, and trusted third parties, and then the skills, awareness, and knowledge sharing that's so critical. And I, I just drilled down on one of these principles, and that's around algorithmic decision making systems. And this en encompasses artificial intelligence and machine learning governance and accountability, defining fairness. And when we talk about fairness, can we use the data? Is it legal? Uh, is, it, is it subject to regulatory constraints, perhaps? And should we use the data? Can it give rise to inappropriate bias? And is the use of the data respectful to the data owner? We also look at decision-making transparency and explainability. When we use the data, how are, how are the outcomes from the use of that data made transparent, to, again, to the data, to the data owner? Uh, what are the human controls around the use of that data? How are outcomes monitored to make sure that they are fair? What measures do we have in place to avoid and prevent damage uh, to the interests of the data owner? And how do we verify how the, how the data is used? And so we talk about uh, governance frameworks that ensure that these algorithmic decision-making systems follow very robust measures for model development, implementation, model use, and model validation. And then I think the final point I'd like to raise in, in connection, I mean, this, this whole area of, of data use uh, is, is just so, so rich. There's so much that we could go into and talk about, and I know we only have a half an hour today, um, but you also need to look at financial inclusion issues. When, as I said, these new, these new technologies are, are, are wonderful and can confer substantial benefits, but one also has to consider that there are large populations that do not have access to technology or to internet connection or cellular service. And uh, there's, we have to be cognizant of the fact that these technical innovations can leave very vulnerable populations behind. So it's important to work on solutions that will facilitate the inclusion of, of these populations. As we're coming out of the pandemic, um, do you see these uh, evol uh, evolutions uh, speed up or keep pace? Or do you think that it will make way for other, um, other um, issues and uh, pressing matters? Well, we have a lot of pressing matters to uh, to address in the in the insurance space, and cyber risk is is a very important one. It's not the only one. Of course, we just finished uh, COP twenty six. Uh, climate issues are front and center, and um, you know 
more than we could possibly uh, um, unpack in this in this short session. But I, I do, as I said before, uh, cyber risk management is here to stay for the long term. It really needs to evolve as the threat landscape evolves, um, and we're just seeing the cyber risk um, landscape expanding in both size and scope, and also in sophistication. Uh, the IIF just had a webinar on cyber risk about a week ago, and one of our speakers was a former FBI assistant director. And what was really uh, interesting to me was uh, his comment that cyber criminals are now becoming much more, uh, you might want to say, corporate in nature. They're actually specializing in combining forces. Uh, they, uh, one criminal group may have a specialty in hacking systems. Another may have a specialty in stealing credentials. And a third group may uh, be the specialist in negotiating ransom. This is like cybercrime as a service. What you don't do well, you contract out to others, just as a company would. So, you know, there are a number of, of very, very pressing matters, but I think this, uh, this lack of any lack of attention to cyber risk, any, any consideration uh, that it needs to move off the radar screen uh, could really have some very grave uh, implications, including financial stability implications when you, when you think that if we don't get a handle on cybercrime, it could lead to a loss of confidence. In the, in the financial system. So I think it's here to stay. And I think the whole area of operational resilience is here to stay. I know it's an upcoming focus of the IAIS going into, into the new year. Uh, it's certainly been a, a, an area of focus for the Financial Stability Board, which is obviously the, uh, the global organization that uh, oversees not just the IAIS, but also the Basel Committee on Banking, Super, um, uh, Banking Supervision. And it's, it's a Basel Committee uh, priority too. So I think we're seeing across the financial services um, sector um, a continued focus on cyber risk and operational resilience. Of course, you just mentioned ESG. Um, so I wanted to touch on the uh, on that on the regulatory side and the supervisory side. Um, how are the new ESG um, ESG regulations that are coming in uh, affecting insurance sector? Well, the whole. Um... The whole discussion of environmental, social, and governance issues has a has a profound effect on the insurance sector, and these considerations have been top of mind for insurance companies and insurance supervisors for for a number of years. And of course, now with uh, just COP twenty six having just ended, uh, they're uh, also very much top of mind uh, going into going into the new year. Uh, when you look at, let's start with the uh, the climate risk um, and the environmental issues. They really have to realize that it affects both sides of the insurance balance sheet, both the asset and liability side. It uh, climate concerns and climate risks impact the value of investments. Uh, Climate risk can give rise to a risk of stranded assets if investee companies are not transitioning their business models in a timely manner. On the liability side, we're seeing uh, the impact, the direct impact of climate risk on property and casualty insurers as natural catastrophes are increasing in size and frequency. So climate risk really does have uh, the potential to be a threat to, uh, again, to financial stability. So it's a very, very important risk for, for insurers to, uh, to, to manage. And from a regulatory and supervisory perspective, I would say there are two areas that really stand out um, in terms of the guidance that we're seeing and in terms of the regulatory and supervisory attention. And those are scenario analysis, and disclosure. We're seeing supervisors across a range of juris jurisdictions uh, develop and pilot exploratory scenario-based climate risk measurement exercises in order to assess the impact on insurers and also banks of the physical and transition risks that stem from climate change. Um, unfortunately, some of these exercises have been 
uh, they've really varied considerably across jurisdictions in terms of their objectives, their approaches, their time horizons and their parameters. And so we find that it's, it's difficult to compare the results of these exercises, and that can lead to some fragmentation in efforts to address climate risk. So we have been at the IIF focusing on uh, looking at these exercises, conducting a stock take on the banking side, which we hope to replicate on the insurance side, to look at some of the design choices that are made and to develop some, um, some ways of uh, looking at those design choices in light of the objectives of the exercise to see how we can create an environment where the exercises are um, more aligned, not identical, but more aligned and tied to the objectives of those exercises. So, so there's a lot to be done in terms of, of scenario analysis, both by the supervisory uh, community and also by the insurers themselves. Um, but that's not to say that these exercises shouldn't be done. They should. At present, they're exploratory, but that's how we improve the exercises over time by starting with, with some exploratory exercises and seeing where that takes us. And these exercises do provide a lot of important insights into the nature and materiality of climate-related financial risk. Um, and that's both at the firm level and also at the, at the sector level. And uh, from what we've seen from the IIS work on the banking side, it seems that some of the near-term risks, at least for banks, are relatively containable, but there are also some very considerable longer-term risks, especially if we get into some of the more severe uh, scenarios. And again, for insurers, we haven't conducted a similar exercise. We're hoping to do that in 2022. But you could imagine that asset side uh, risks could be considerable, especially in a disorderly or sudden transition where public policy changes quickly and the value of companies that might be on the wrong side of, of some of those public policy decisions or companies that haven't transitioned sufficiently uh, could be the value of those companies could be very precipitously um, impacted. And so then let me turn to disclosure. There's a lot of work that's being done on disclosure and uh, a number of regulators are, um, are asking more of the financial services sector in, in terms of disclosure. I think everybody's pretty familiar with the Financial Stability Board's uh, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. Um, and the TCFD has issued uh, recommendations for decision useful forward-looking climate disclosure in four key thematic areas, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. And um, the metrics and targets are going to be the subject of some, some, future, some future work. Uh, there's also going to be work uh, done by the, uh, the standard setters, such as the IAIS on on climate disclosures. And also individual jurisdictions have issued uh, climate disclosure guidance. As a final question, I wanted to know, where do you see uh, the future of, of climate risk regulation go? Well, thank you, Lily. And I think that um, climate risk regulation will continue to, to expand as well as supervision uh, of climate risk. Of regulators and supervisors are moving beyond monitoring what companies are doing to actively supervising against their expectations. And I think what is also coming in the future is a consideration. I believe it's premature right now. Uh, we don't know enough at the moment to, um, to translate climate risk into hard metrics or, or prudential capital standards, but I think that it's certainly something that will be increasingly considered as we, as we move into the future. Um, 
how a capital charge could reflect the near term and longer term impacts of climate risk on a company's balance sheets and profitability, uh, whether an add on should be applied to firms with inadequate climate risk management and governance arrangements. And these developments are in the early stages, but they are uh, being considered in, in some key jurisdictions. And I think what is also coming in the future is, it, and already is, is present at, uh, right now, is some impatience from the regulators and supervisors with companies that have not incorporated climate risk into their enterprise risk management frameworks. And as I said, um, regulators are moving from assessing firms implementation of climate risk management to actively supervising against those supervisory expectations. We certainly see that in the UK PRA. And also I think we'll see that in some climate guidance that will be coming for, uh, shortly uh, from uh, some of the uh, US insurance regulators. Mary Francis, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Lily. It's been a pleasure 